In this video, we're going to talk about the basics of the cell membrane. In lab, if you remember, the cell membrane on the cell models were really hard and stiff. In reality, your cell membrane isn't like that. It's very fluid and ever-changing. So think about it, if you go and blow a bubble and you watch the bubble and the outside is always changing, looks different, your cell membrane is very similar. And it's very delicate, like that bubble. Now, difference is what bubbles don't have that cell membranes do is they have all these proteins that allow the cell to interact with the outside. Whether molecules can go directly through a cell membrane or whether they have to go through a protein to get in there. So some things will have to go in and out through a protein, which we'll talk about. Other things may never even enter the cell but bind to a receptor protein, which we'll talk about, and actually cause a change inside the cell. So the cell membrane has all these proteins on it. The reason we go through this is because a lot of diseases and a lot of drugs deal with the cell membrane. Drugs are going to interact with the cell membrane, cause changes in the cell, and a lot of diseases are caused because something has gone wrong within the cell membrane. So cell membranes are made of lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates, all organic molecules. Again, the cell membrane allows the cell to communicate with the outside world. And it's what we call selectively permeable. It's going to control which substances go in and out. Small molecules can do what we call diffusion, can diffuse in and out from high to low concentration. Other molecules that are either charged or too big have to go through these protein channels. Other molecules may even be so big that they'll have to be engulfed like a Pac-Man to get into the cell. And we'll talk about those later on in a different video. So we're going to talk about some of the proteins the general protein types that you see on a cell membrane. The first one I want to talk about is what are called recognition proteins. And the best way I can explain a recognition protein to you is if that's your cell membrane or my cell membrane, I have a unique signature of proteins on my cell membrane that tells my body that this cell is me, itself. Now why do we need those? We need them because you have an immune system which is going to fight off infections and fight off foreign pathogens. So the white blood cell has to know how to identify a cell as being you or being something foreign. So if this white blood cell comes up to this cell, it looks at that protein signature and it leaves it alone because it's me. On the other side, if I have a bacterial infection with a mean evil bacteria okay, that's trying to get me, it's going to have a different signature on it. When that white blood cell comes up to that bacteria, it's going to identify it as being foreign and it's going to set off an immune response that's going to destroy it. This also plays a role, these proteins also play a role in organ transplants. If one of you is going to give me a heart because I need it, okay, and let's pretend your name is Dan Miller, which chances are it's not, but let's say your name is Dan Miller, you have a unique set of protein recognition proteins in your cell membrane just like I do. The problem is, is my white blood cell, when it comes up to this Dan Miller heart, guess what it's going to do? It's going to do the same thing that it did to this bacteria. It's going to induce an immune response and it's going to be destroyed. So when someone has an organ transplant, they have to have enough of these proteins similar enough that the immune system will not, will not attack it. So when you hear about organ rejection, what organ rejection is, is basically your immune system has done what it's supposed to. It's attacked a foreign organ. Now, as a side note here, who would be most likely to be able to give me an organ? It would be a sibling, okay, because my proteins came from the genes from my mother and father, so I have a unique combination. My brother would be most likely to have a similar combination. Or if I got more of the proteins from my mother or my father, one of them could be an organ donor. The only people that have exact donors are identical twins. Now even if you have a donor that's close, people that get organ transplants have to take what are called immunosuppressive drugs. And what immunosuppressive drugs do is they make these white blood cells drink. Okay, they've had too much to drink, they're kind of drunk, and they come up to this foreign cell and they're like, meh, you're not one of us, but I don't really care, and it leaves it alone. Now there's a problem with that. The good part is, is that yes, it doesn't attack your organ, but the bad part is, what happens when this bacteria or virus comes in, or you get a cancerous cell, and this white blood cell is too drunk and can't attack it. So that's the disadvantage of it. Now obviously, if you need a heart as an organ, you're going to do an organ transplant. So recognition proteins 
allow your white blood cells to identify your cells as being self. Red blood cells will talk about blood typing and who can give to who and why. You can't just give blood to anybody or you can't just get blood from anybody because of certain recognition proteins that we'll talk about. And we just talked about organ transplants and some of the issues with them. Now some transplants, obviously like a heart you're going to get, but hand transplants um, have become more common. And there's some controversy there, there's some ethical issues with that because a person can live without a hand and if a person does get a hand transplant, then they are on these immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of their lives. So they are more susceptible to diseases, they are more susceptible to developing cancer. And to be honest, it's actually easier for doctors to transplant a heart than it is to transplant a hand. Because when you transplant a hand, I mean, look down at your hand. There's bone there, there's nerves they have to reattach, there are ligaments, there are tendons. It's much more difficult. And a person that gets a hand transplant person that gets a hand transplant is never going to have the same mobility and strength in that transplanted hand as they did in their original hand. Okay, the next type of protein is called a receptor protein. And what I want you to notice here is here's the outside of the cell and here's the inside. This is the receptor protein. Notice there's no way to get through here. This is the hormone. This is what's going to bind to a receptor protein. Now when this hormone binds to that receptor protein, it's never going to enter the cell, but it's going to cause changes on the inside of the cell. So this is how hormones work. We talked briefly at the beginning of the semester about the endocrine system. So hormones are secreted by glands. They travel through the bloodstream. Now they have to fit. Not every hormone will fit into this receptor protein. Only the ones that fit. And when they fit, then they cause changes inside the cell. And I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. So sometimes molecules on the outside will bind and cause changes on the inside, just like I told you. Okay. So a lot of drugs will work this way. Medications will bind to some of these receptor proteins. We're going to talk about neurotransmitters. And in the brain that conducts signals, they bind to receptor proteins. But again, the key is they have to fit. They have to fit to that receptor protein. Okay. It's a lock and key kind of mechanism. Channel proteins. Channel proteins are, the example is the one right here. It's kind of like a tunnel or a door, a doorway into the cell. So this is going to allow big molecules and ions to travel into the cell. Now ions, remember, aren't very big, but let me give you an example. Remember we talked about sodium. Anything that's charged cannot diffuse or go through the membrane easily. And we'll talk about diffusion in the next uh, video. So charged molecules cannot, they'll bounce back, okay? they'll bounce back, they'll be repelled away from the cell membrane. So charged molecules like ions have to have channel proteins. You'll see these specifically when we get to, they're located all over, but you'll see them being very important when we get to the nervous system. So sodium, you have sodium potassium channels, we'll talk about these channel proteins on neurons, neurons are part of your nervous system. In the genetic disease cystic fibrosis, what people lack is they lack chloride channels. So people with cystic fibrosis, it's a genetic disease, actually the most common genetic disease that we see in Caucasian Americans, is they lack chloride channels, so chloride can't move in and out of their cells. Without these chloride channels, they have severe lung problems, digestive problems. So again, it shows you that you get this change, a small change in a cell, and yet it can lead to major problems disease-wise through organs and systems of the body. All right, I'm going to show you an example of how these things can work. Uh, we may have briefly talked about diabetes when we talked about blood sugar and homeostasis. And if you remember, we talked about how insulin, insulin helps control blood sugar. Okay. Blood sugar has to stay, just a reminder, blood sugar has to stay in our little range. Okay. Now this is blood sugar. So what has to happen is when your blood sugar starts to go up, let's say for breakfast you have a pint of ice cream and three candy bars and I don't know, we'll throw in an apple there just to make you healthy, and three sticks of gum. Okay. So you have all this sugar. Your blood sugar is going to start to go up. Now we need a way to keep it from going above our normal range. Because if it goes too high, it's actually not good for your nervous system, and it starts to beat on your small blood vessels and can cause problems there. 
So here's what's going to happen. Here's our receptor protein. Here we have a channel protein. Now this channel protein is a little different than the one I showed you on the last slide in that it has a door. Okay, it has a door. And this door is going to be closed. This channel protein is going to allow glucose to travel into the cell. But to travel through that door, this has to be open. Okay, to go through that doorway, I should say, this is more of a doorway. To travel through this doorway, the door has to be open. So here's what happens. You eat your ice cream for breakfast and your Twinkies, if they're still making them, okay, and your blood sugar goes up. Okay, your blood sugar goes up. So here we have our negative feedback. So our body's going to work to bring it back towards set point. What's going to happen is your body is going to secrete a hormone called insulin, which is probably most of you have probably heard of that. Insulin is produced by the pancreas, which we have down here. This is going to mi mimic insulin. What will happen is when your blood sugar goes up, your body will sense that and your pancreas will release insulin. And there it goes. Now it will travel around the bloodstream, but it will only bind to cells where there are receptor proteins for insulin, like right here. Now remember I told you when a hormone binds, it never goes into the cell in this case, but what it's going to do, it's going to cause a change. Now the change it's going to cause in this case is it's going to open the door. So watch what happens. The door opens and now what can the blood sugar do? Now the sugar that's in the blood, the glucose that's in the blood, can enter the cell. Now what happens over here? As the glucose goes into the cell, Sorry about that. As the glucose goes into the cell, your blood sugar starts to come back towards set point. So what insulin allows us to do is to get our blood sugar to go down. Without insulin, the door won't open. So let me show you that one more time. Just go through the process. So you have your ice cream and your blood sugar goes up. Blood sugar is going up here. Your pancreas secretes insulin. The insulin binds to an insulin receptor protein causes a change in the cell that causes the door to open. The doorway is now open and the sugar can go into the cell bringing your blood sugar down. Now just briefly to talk about diabetes. People with type 1 diabetes, people with type 1 diabetes, they don't make insulin. Their pancreas does not function properly in this respect and they don't make insulin. So they don't have any way of, of opening that doorway. So what happens to them if they ate three scoops of ice cream and gum and whatever else I said for breakfast, their blood sugar will continue to go up way past set point and that can be really dangerous. So what they have to do, they have to do is they have to take insulin. They have to take insulin, replace the insulin and time it correctly with their diet. Time it correctly with their diet so that they maintain proper blood sugar in this range. Now type 2 diabetes, people do with type 2 diabetes do have insulin. They do produce insulin, but their body or cells are insensitive to it. We don't know exactly why, but for some reason when they have insulin, it doesn't bind as correctly. Their blood sugar doesn't go as high as a type 1 diabetics, but it may be in this range, but that's still too high and that can still cause health problems. So type 2 diabetes, people usually have to take drugs that help maintain their blood sugar or help insulin do its job better. Now in some cases type 2 diabetics do have to take insulin. Now type 1 a person doesn't really have a lot of control over getting. It's actually an autoimmune disease where their own immune system starts attacking their pancreas when they're young. Type 2 diabetics can help themselves by monitoring their diet, losing weight, exercising, and not smoking. So type 2 diabetics, not always, but most of the time through lifestyle changes, can really help I don't want to say cure the disease, but control the disease so they can maintain healthy blood sugar levels. So that just shows you how all these proteins within the cell work together.